Our next presentation is uh, by Zachary Allen at uh, Bismarck State College. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Zachary Allen with the National Energy Center of Excellence here at Bismarck State College. And what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this morning is our remote lab initiative here at the Energy Center. It's a little bit different than uh, what you might think when you think of remote laboratories. First of all, where remote laboratories fit uh, within our development process here at the National Energy Center of Excellence is within what I call our interactive learning tool pyramid. Now what this is, is this is a methodology that we began implementing uh, for curriculum development as part of our electrical transmission system technologies program that was funded by an NSF ATE grant. And we started looking at adding interactivity to all of our online as well as our campus courses. Now at the bottom of the pyramid, we start very basic with the online versions of our lectures. And we're not talking about video, we're talking about interactive type animations and uh, adding content with pictures, with videos, with other types of tools uh, to replace the traditional lecture format. Above that is animations. Animations are great because we can take difficult concepts. And let me step back real quick and say, you know, here at the National Energy Center of Excellence, we actually have eight technical programs and one four-year degree program. So when we're dealing with these materials, we're teaching technical concepts to people who may not be able to come to campus. So when I say technical and energy, they might need to figure out how a check valve works. They may need to figure out how a three-phase generator works. So when I say an animation is useful, imagine me trying to describe you in text the interaction of magnetic fields inside a three-phase machine. But doing so in an animation, it becomes very apparent. Mini sims or mini simulations. One thing we found with simulation, we use a lot of simulation in the energy industry, is there's pretty much two forms of simulation out there. There's full fidelity simulation, which are used by energy companies. Uh, they're very popular. They're required, for example, in transmission. They're required in nuclear power plant operation. But they're very complex, and they're designed for people who are already in the industry, operators and engineers, who know how to operate them. So what we came up with was a concept of the mini-sim. Why go to a full fidelity simulation when the objectives you're teaching are, say, on generator synchronization? We can strip down the model to just the components we need to teach those objectives and not overwhelm the student. Full simulations are on top of that. We do actually have the ability to do some full fidelity simulation. We're currently involved in a process that I'll speak about in a minute to add even more uh, actually industrial um, scale, full fidelity simulation. And what's unique is at the very top of this pyramid, and when this first came out, we started working on the remote labs about seven years ago, was laboratories themselves. Can we deliver laboratories online? And what you'll notice at the bottom of the presentation, it says, is all of these interactive learning tools, ILTs, must be web native. And the reason why we publish and develop web native is we can put those right into our classroom courses with no effort and they work well online, so it, it's, it's a double value for us. When we talk about cyber infrastructure and where, uh, for example, uh, information services here on campus as well as the state comes in, is how these materials are actually deployed. When you look at the lectures, the animations, the mini-sims, I group those as client-side developments. And when I say client-side developments, what I'm talking about is they're delivered and run on the client machines. So when we deliver those to a student, it actually processes, downloads and processes on the client machine. So after the initial download, there is no more data connectivity back to some sort of central system. Well, what's really nice about that is we leverage the user's computer's processing power to actually run the models. With the lectures, there are no models. Animations have some interactivity. The mini sims actually do have models. The full sims are uh, have full models, and some of them we do deliver on the client side. However, when we talk about full fidelity simulation, those uh, are mostly server side. Now, what you see is the, the LED uh, you know, lights at the bottom going from green to red, and that, that represents the cost and time to develop. I manage our curriculum development center at the NECE, and we have four now FTEs that develop these for our faculty. And what we found is as we go up this uh, scale, up the pyramid, which would be from left to right on this graph, it becomes more costly, both in the development terms 
and in terms of operation and maintenance. The other piece that becomes uh, more intensive as we go up is the collaboration needed to make these projects work. When I can deliver an, a lecture that can be generated by faculty, go to our development group, be translated online, and pushed and run on a remote computer, there's a lot less collaboration needed there than when I go to a remote laboratory where I actually have to have the lab engineered, built, work with information services to be able to remote that laboratory, build the scheduling system, and, and on and on and on. So what we've found here at the NECE is actually your best value for your dollar is the animations and mini-sims because we remove the whole uh, added labor of building a laboratory, maintaining a laboratory, and remoting a laboratory. Not saying they're not valuable, but we have to recognize that they do cost more and take longer to develop. The Web Lab architecture is our platform for remote laboratories. Uh, this was put online originally as a proof of concept with a uh, NSF CCLI, that's Course Curriculum Laboratory Improvement Grant, about six years ago, and we've had great luck with it. And every subsequent remote lab has been built on the same architecture. The difference being uh, we've now collaborated with our campus information services to uh, move this to our virtualized server platform and give us the expandability and scalability we need to start adding more of these, which I'll show you in a second. The architecture is very simple. This is a very high-level diagram. Up at the top uh, left, you'll see the laboratory control systems. What's unique about our remote labs here at BSC is that each lab runs independently and is actually in charge of itself. And now that's going to come in very important when I get to safety and reliability in a moment here. Uh, on our campus network, we then have our application servers, which host our applications. Uh, those were developed in-house, our databases, our front-end web servers, and our video subsystem. Now, what's also unique about the web lab architecture is the laboratory system, the middleware, and the web client, those three systems are independent and know the state of each other. So if any one of those systems fails, the other systems will disconnect, shut down, and reconnect as they can. And this becomes really important because we book and run these labs 24-7. So a laboratory could have a hardware failure. It would recognize it, shut itself down safely, and inform the student. Or we could have a database failure, uh, which the laboratory would detect, shut itself down. The client would detect and tell the student again. What I really want to talk about, though, is some of the lessons we learned building these because they are unique. Uh, they are quite fun, actually, and, and we'll get a couple examples in. But we learned some hard lessons. Uh, first of all, you know, what is a good candidate for a remote laboratory? We just saw the electron microscope at NDSU. Anything that you can have data stored or access data through a centralized process is candidate for a remote laboratory. Anything that can be automated okay, is a candidate for a remote laboratory. Almost everything we own now has some sort of telemetry gathering in it. Your cell phone has sensors that you'd be amazed your cell phone has. Uh, equipment used in hospitals gathers telemetry. And with you know, microcontrollers coming down, with Ethernet controllers and, and wireless protocols like Zigbee coming out, we can get this telemetry out of these devices. We can then move it across the Internet. Uh, there was an article in Computer World just the other day about how a remote intensive care unit saved a man's life. And there, the doctor, some hundred miles away, was able to remotely gain his vitals and uh, make a determination and keep that man alive. So anything that can be automated, anything that's already gathering telemetry, and you'd be surprised the number of things that are IP enabled now, uh, we can look at for remote technology. But in the last six, seven years of developing these, what have we learned? Uh, technical. Uh, integration is really important. One of the, the areas that we struggled with is scheduling of remote laboratories because remote laboratories themselves, there is only one piece of equipment. I mean, if you build a laboratory, you have a laboratory. So you know, when you're getting students to access this, how do you manage that? Single activities, group activities, instructor interaction. And one of the areas that we found that was really important moving forward was integration with our other campus services. For example, the new version of the scheduler we're currently building for the remote laboratory system integrates into the university system's active directory so we don't have to store separate username and credentials for our students. Um, LMS integration. If you have an online learning management system, do you want to integrate this into uh, the gradebook and, and things like that, your other assessments? Bandwidth issues. 
we all know that bandwidth becomes an issue. One of the things that our remote laboratories are optimized for are 56K modems. These laboratories will work on dial-up connections if they don't want the video feed. So we're just talking about the analog and digital data. The web lab proof of concept, which is a power grid laboratory, has roughly 150 pieces of uh, analog and digital data. They will update once a second on a 56K modem. Uh, client downloads, again, how big is your interface? The average interface size for one of our remote laboratories is about 200K. That's the initial download the student has to make. Server data, like I said, how can we run these once per second updates on a 56K modem? Optimizing your server data. When do you want to use XML? When do you want to use HTTP? Data payloads for 150 data points, we can get down to a couple K a second. So we can do a lot of optimization. Video, is video necessary? If it is, when do you use it? How do you use it? Can really optimize uh, your system. Firewall issues are real important. Um, as a technical school, training people in the industry, specifically energy industry, I'm up against some of the toughest corporate firewall and, and uh, cybersecurity standards in the country. So how do I make these applications run in an energy utility control center that's locked down uh, for cybersecurity? So know your, know your corporate policy issues. Can you install applications? Can't you? Things like that. Cross-platform functionality and compatibility. What delivery mechanism are you going to use? Development. Resource commitment's another one we, we learned the hard way on here at the NEC. These need to be treated as big projects, and they need the budget and resources allocated them of a project of this magnitude. You know, we think remote lab or, or you know, online lab, and people think, well, it's just online. Well, if we're building a full laboratory, it's the same scope as the laboratory plus all of the remote. And make sure you have the, the subject matter experts who can get the work done. My point here, though, is leverage your campus, leverage the resources. You know, you might find you have folks with these skills already there. Sound academics. You know, building labs for the sake of building the labs isn't good. And same with all of the ILTs we develop here at the NECE. Those come based on the instructional design of our coursework, meeting our objectives. They then come to be developed and then are handed back to the faculty who teach it for integration into the coursework. Documentation. These are real laboratories. Again, you need to do operation and maintenance on them. Having the proper documentation will ha help you. Safety and reliability. These labs run 24-7. We book them out um, any time of the day, especially in our industry, because we have people who are shift workers in the energy industry. So it's not uncommon for me to check the logs and see the lab was booked from 2 to 4 and on a Sunday morning. But when we do that, how do we make sure that an electrical laboratory is safe? Uh, we're just putting online a process laboratory, which uses water as its fluid. How do we make sure that the water doesn't spill out? How do we make sure that it doesn't evaporate out? Who maintains these labs? So having the labs, when I mentioned that architecture, that the labs are self-contained, they take care of their own safety. They won't run if there's no water, if the pump goes dry. They won't run if something's wrong with one of the motor generator sets. So all the labs have to be safe intrinsically at the lab end before it's even remoted. 